right, here's a really cool story. I don't know the, uh, oh my gosh, Gemma, Link, Gemma, get. Man, these chickens are driving me crazy. I'm sending you my story of an interaction I had with something many years ago. I'm sending, you, I'm sending you this in a way to get it off my chest. I've only told this story to two people before, one my wife and the other my brother, but I still feel the need to sort of get it out after all this time. Hold on just a minute, y'all. Gemma, get All right, there, I closed my door now. We shouldn't be interrupted anymore. About 28 or 29 years ago, I worked for a hospital in West Palm Beach, Florida. The hospital has since closed down. I had worked there for a few years and used the same route to go to and from work on every shift. I lived in Royal Palm Beach at the time. That meant that I drove east to work in the morning and west back home in the afternoon. On this day, I was leaving work for home. I had come to know the streets on my drive quite well, and I came to recognize the scenery. For example, one house always had kids' bicycles in the front yard. They were dropped where they had left them, and there was a basketball or two in the yard, and certain cars in particular driveways. This was the normal scenery for these streets, and I would notice if something was different or unusual. I saw a large, dirty, white object to my left up the street. It was not normally there. At first, I thought someone had discarded an old white or tan recliner, or that I was looking at a discarded washing machine. It was far enough away that I couldn't quite figure out what it was yet, and as I got closer to it, it took more and more of my attention. I just couldn't figure it out, but there was something about it that bothered me. As I got even closer, I continued to look at it and wondered, what the hell is that? I looked in my rearview mirror, and I saw no cars were behind me, and I began to slow down to get a better look. When I was several car lengths from it, I took my foot off the gas, and I slowed down even more. My truck was just coasting now. When I got two or three car lengths from it, I suddenly realized that the thing that I was looking at was alive. I could see skin and pores, and it looked like a plucked bird. Suddenly, the object seemed to be in hyper detail to me, and I could see skin and pores and wrinkles and grass stains here and there. I thought, this thing can't be real. It can't. But I see skin, and I'm looking at something's back, and it's huge. It's as big as a washing machine, and it's crouching down. I didn't see arms or legs or a head yet, just the back. When I was 10 or 12 feet away from it, looking at its right side and the back of its head, it slowly and very casually turned its head to look at me. I looked directly into its face and eyes, and again, everything seemed to come into hyper detail with its face seemingly to be directed in front of my face. It had jet black eyes, no visible whites. There was a small straight mouth and slits for nostrils and black freckles on its face. I don't remember seeing ears or hair. Its face was devoid of emotion, completely blank. I got no sense of male or female. It was intent on me, and then it considered me, and then it dismissed me. I've had years to think about this part of the interaction, and to say it studied me or examined me would be wrong, as that would imply too much effort. It considered me like I was a bug on the sidewalk. At this point, I felt a slight push or pressure like someone touching my forehead and upper chest gently with a finger, and I felt and heard this one is of no consequence. The first two words of this kind were implied, but the rest of the thought was clear as a bell. This thing, this not human, not animal, considered me of no consequence. I can't identify this thing, and it doesn't consider me a danger. It doesn't consider my seeing it a threat. It considered me of no consequence. Like that bug on the sidewalk, while this thing was considering me and pushing into my consciousness, I got to look into it, 
a slight look, but it was a look. This thing was not lost. It was not alien, and not scared or hesitant. It was comfortable and confident. It was in its natural habitat where it lived and it had been in contact with humans before. At no time was I scared during this interaction. I was just confused, never having seen anything like this before, and I had nothing to compare it to. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I thought to myself that I can't be seeing this, and even as the truck was still slowly coasting, I closed my eyes for a second, and I put my head down thinking, I'm not seeing this, and I picked my head up and I opened my eyes, and what I saw only makes some sense at all all these years later. I recently saw a YouTube video of one of the Navajo Rangers, and he said that some entities are able to give us what he called snapshot memories or visuals to substitute for what you were really looking at, and I think that's what happened. When I opened my eyes, I was looking at an Australian shepherd dog. It was black and brown and white and sitting there staring at me. It didn't move, it didn't blink, it didn't sniff, and it definitely was not a normal dog. I kept looking at it, and it never moved. And I watched it in the side view mirror as it faded behind me, and it never moved. It just continued to watch me drive away. I think I might have forgotten about the whole thing if it wasn't for that push and the hearing of that of no consequence, which ended up really angering me at being dismissed like that. And that's the end of the story. Now, I thought this story was appropriate because I think I think in New Mexico or Arizona, there's a story going around of a uh, something streaking out of the sky. Uh, many people saw it. And then there's a call to 911 uh, from this family who is claiming that something landed in their backyard and there are alien eight or nine foot tall creatures walking around in their backyard. This story seems to be getting traction. It's kind of, go- it's kind of probably semi gone viral. We're hearing a lot of things. Uh, there was a whistleblower not, uh, recently talking about the Roswell incident and that uh, the United States has a spacecraft or some kind of craft built uh, not on this earth and Creatures or the pilots, at least the pilots of the craft, uh, they're dead, but they have them uh, preserved and are studying them and are trying to reverse engineer the crafts that they commandeered. And this is all interesting. And it's almost like after this whistleblower uh, made these revelations, and I I don't know if 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 what he's saying is valid, I have no idea. But I'm following the story and trying to figure out, looking at YouTube videos, reading articles, trying to find everything I can. But this is really interesting stuff. Uh, There's a video of this family trying to get in their backyard, the one that called 911, and they are scared to death. They're both, all of them are armed, and they're trying to walk in the gate, and they keep seeing something, and they're backing out, and you don't see it in the video. Anyway, uh, just to cut to the point, it kind of seems like these incidents are kind of gaining frequency. I, I, don't, I don't, I don't understand it, but you know, the UFO thing was has always been interesting to me. But these reports that are coming out are fascinating. And you know what's weird? No, nobody cares. Nobody seems to care about it. It's not front page news. It's not. Of course, there's a lot of things going on in our country. A lot of uh, corruption and things like that. It's not front page news at all. It's like, it's like, I I don't know what the deal is, but the news cycle and the news, the way people report news is so foreign to what I'm used to all my life. But anyway, I thought this story kind of went along with, um, or I think current events can compare and contrast to this man's experience. What could that thing have been? I don't know, but it was a fascinating story. Sorry, I'll talk so much after this story, but it's, uh, it was really good. And I wanted to make sure you you uh, you heard it. So thanks to the writer for sending it. All right, let's see if we can piss a few people off in this segment of the podcast. I have mentioned before to the greater audience of this podcast that I get crazy emails from people. You can imagine. You can just imagine. 
and I've never really gone into detail about what they say, but I brought a couple up here just to give you a little flavor of the kind of emails that I get, and they make me laugh, and I'm going to read these and kind of respond point by point because they're so absurd, it's unreal. I have another one on my phone. It's the best one I've ever gotten, and I can't seem to transfer it to my computer, but I will. I will. I'll figure it out, and I'll get it in a podcast uh, coming up pretty soon. But here's the first one, and this is this is one of probably 300 emails I've gotten over the years. The writer says, I have a question for you. You seem pretty balanced and level-headed in all that I've heard over the years. I've been a subscriber to your YouTube and podcast for a couple of years. Thank you very much. I appreciate you subscribing and listening. But why the fascination with Steve Lilly? From what I gather, he's a paid Sasquatch hitman. That is correct. I have no love for this type of person. He's a cold-blooded killer, or am I mistaken? The fact that you made a channel just for him is beyond me. Are you so desperate for ratings? You promote the senseless killing of an obviously intelligent and feeling being. Okay. You have no idea if this creature, if it even exists or if it's in, if it does, if it's intelligent or if it has feelings. I'm just, I'm sorry to pop your bubble there. He goes on to write, if I'm wrong, please educate me. I'm just curious as to your reasoning for the support for Steve. No disrespect meant to you. I love your podcast and videos, but do not get your fascination. And I do not get your fascination and support of Steve Lilly. Be well, Eric. Uh, The only thing I can tell you, Eric, is I write those stories because I want to. How's that? Okay, here's the next one. I have two more. Here's one. Y'all, I have a chicken. I'll stop here for just a second. I have chickens in my office. Now, I know y'all think that's funny. But we have been covered up with snakes this year. Uh, The last seven days, I bet I have pulled 10 or 12 snakes out of my, out of the laying boxes. They're not venomous snakes. They're not dangerous. They will bite you. I've been bitten a couple of times. Uh, If I had the camera on, I'd show you this uh, scab on my hand from where a snake bit me. And I I need to look up what kind of snake is, but it's the most common snake in this little local area, at least on my place. But they're these big snakes and they can fit an egg in their mouth. They can eat uh, chicks up to, you know, maybe, maybe a couple of months old. And we do have some chicks, but they haven't messed with our chicks, but they're eating the eggs. And so now these chickens are, are, are shy of the nesting boxes and they want to come in my office and lay eggs. We're finding eggs everywhere in my lawnmower seat and my tractor seat. So if you, I don't know if y'all can hear that scratching, but she's over there on the plywood floor trying to make a nest. And I'm just going to let her lay her egg there. Cause then that's food for me. So I'm going to, I'm going to oblige her and let, and I've got another one standing right outside the door, kind of scoping things out. So that it may get even louder. Okay. Let's go to the next email. I've got two more emails. Uh, this woman, I think the woman said, I think it's a woman. She says, you've been honest that you've never had any contact with these beings and it shows. I think that's a, I think that's a cut to me, but I, I'm not going to lie to you. I've never seen any sign, never seen a Bigfoot, never seen any evidence of Bigfoot. And I am a skeptic. I've said that ever since I started this channel, but I do love the stories on with the email. I've listened to your readings from people and that's fine. But I made the mistake of tuning into your Steve Lilly series, and I find it horrific and disgusting. These beings are just like people. Some are good and some are bad. My experience has been good. Nothing like what you portrayed. I'm a 57-year-old native Mississippian who never, ever thought I would experience a relationship other other than with my own family. Please stop vilifying what you know nothing about. It only encourages people to hate and fear what they don't know. I'm speaking from my heart, and I wish you no ill. Well, ma'am, I wish you no ill either, but you have no idea what these things are. We we don't even have a verified picture photograph of a Bigfoot. Now, everybody will say we do, but it's not. We don't have a... They've not been studied. They're not recognized by 
any university, any wildlife agency, and you have no idea these things could be vicious and they could be eating people if they exist, or they could be Harry and the Hendersons. You don't know. But thank you for the email. You don't have to listen to my Steve Lilly stories, and the reason I write them is because I want to. Okay, here's the last email. And this is part of why I love writing. This is totally, this is on the other end of the spectrum. And this is why, yep, these chickens are getting real lively in here. They're ready to lay some eggs in my floor. Uh, they're distracting me, so I'm sorry. Uh, but here's here's a great email. And this is uh, to, just to show you on the other end, I get way more of these than I get the negative emails. I just think the negative emails are so ludicrous. But here's what the man writes. My father, uh, Staff Sergeant, he gives his name. I'm not going to I'm not going to say his name, but they're from Detroit and he served in the Marine Corps during Vietnam. He was in six years of combat and he passed away on April 18, 2022. I wanted you to know how much your show meant to us. His PTSD could get the best of him most days, but your shows with Steve Lilly always brought a smile to his face and gave us hours of conversations during his final months on Earth. Sometimes the conversations were hard to come by on my weekly visits with him, but when a Steve Lilly episode was published, our weekend conversations were long and winded. And I can't thank you enough for the good times you gave me with my father towards the end. And I'm forever grateful to you and your podcast. And he says, I'm a fan for life, Kevin. Uh, Kevin, uh, this is, you know, to get to get an email like this, to actually impress with uh, my crazy, weird imagination with Steve Lilly, to impress a staff sergeant, uh, who served in the Marine Corps in combat for six years in Vietnam, one of the hardest wards I think our men uh, ever had to fight. That means more to me than anything. This man has credit. He has life experience. He he knows what life is about. He knows he he knows so much more. Has so much more wisdom than any of us, and he got a kick out of the Steve Lilly stories, and that's all they're for. They're just for you to laugh at, for you to enjoy the action. I know they get violent, but that's part of life. This Marine knows that. So that's why I write these, and so and I'm going to keep writing them, and the reason I write them is uh, I can add one more reason I write these other than because I want to is that uh, people like this enjoy them. There's a lot of people who enjoy them. And so I'm just going to keep writing them. You don't have to listen to them. So all that to say, I just wanted to give you a little taste of some of the emails. And if, and if I can find that really, really ultra crazy one and get it up on my screen on my computer, I'll read it to you. But just to give you a little taste of uh, some of the people out there and the things that bother them, I mainly just want to say, just listen to the story or not, move on with your life. You don't have to spend that much time thinking about this. Steve Lilly is not worth that much depth of thought. It really isn't. It's just a silly set of stories about a crazy guy and his crew from Memphis. It's all fiction. None of it is real. It's not modeled after anybody. The stories are not made to cut into anybody else's yard. It's all just for fun. So I hope you enjoy it. And uh, okay, let's go on to another story here. All right, here's an email from, well, she doesn't say whether to use her name or not. I guess if I said her name, well, no, I'm just not going to. I'm going to stick with my policy, but here's what she writes. Two of my granddaughters took my husband and me to the Gatlinburg, Tennessee, to the Bigfoot conference two years ago. I was gravitated straight to you because I heard your voice. I was pleased with the total package. Well, I guess so, ma'am. I ain't just good looking. I'm smart, too. I'm glad she likes the total package. I'm just kidding with y'all. I know what she means, but it was... I'm trying to... uh, I met so many people there that... uh, Oh, and by the way, I went to the uh, Bigfoot Conference in Anniston, Alabama. It was a little lackluster. There weren't many people there. It's kind of a letdown, actually. There was like six or eight vendors, and 
all the people there were nice. I got to meet uh, Chris and Lucas. Lucas, my little buddy from Alabama. I got. Let's see. Let me try to remember all the names. I met met Jay, uh, Jeff. I met Jody and Joel. I got to see Neoma and her husband Brad. Uh, my good good friend Lenita Bryant. She was there helping organize it. I got to finally meet uh, Mary Catherine Scruggs. I got to. Let's see, who else? I got to meet Tex from Texas Front Porch. We had some good discussions. And I met two women who have a podcast. They're kind of, they're good friends with Tex called Blondes and Booze. They have a paranormal podcast. And uh, I'm going to link their podcast in the description below. And you guys can check them out. Matter of fact, I got one of them to talk to me. Everywhere I go, I carry this little recording device where you can clip a lavalier mic on your shirt. And I just hit a button and I can record anything. So if you ever run into me somewhere and you want to tell a story, I've usually got it with me and I can stick it on your shirt. You can tell your story right there and I'll put it in a podcast because these stories are great. But let's see, who else did I meet in Anniston? I'm trying to run through. If I didn't mention your name, I'm sorry. But uh, And the two girls with the Blondes and Boo podcast are Krista and Brandy. And they're really fun. They're real talkative and fun and friendly and Texas friendly. All these people I got to meet at these conferences is really why I go. I didn't have a booth there. I just kind of showed up and sat with Neoma and got to talk with them and got to meet a few people. So it was a good thing. Okay, back to this story. Almost 50 years ago, I had my experience with Bigfoot. I remember every minute detail. After the incident, I went to work and I told it and I was laughed at. So I shut up about it. And with that said, I would appreciate being anonymous. Well, you know what? It's a good thing I didn't say her name because she did tell me she wanted to be anonymous. We live in a small town outside Kansas City, Missouri. We bought a small place with several acres surrounded by woods on three sides. I hung a sign on the gate and I named our farm. I'm not going to say the name of her farm because she wants to be anonymous because there may be some people in the area that have seen this sign. But anyway, she hangs a sign name in their farm. And she said because it was one of the cheaper spreads. Summer was winding down into fall and I had canned and frozen a garden bounty. And I made our own butter and I froze it too. It was October and my husband took the pork and beef to the processor and he told me to clean out the meat freezer before it was ready. There are things the processor sends that I would starve rather than eat, like the heart and the tongue and the brains and the tailbones and such. I always just threw them away. But now we still needed to get a trash pickup. There was a wash just a short distance from the back of my house, and my husband said we could dump the trash down there, and we would have a friend of his covered up with a dozer. I threw about 20 white paper wrapped packages of frozen meat down in that wash. By the way, did I mention that I was pregnant? I was just past eight months pregnant, which meant I made several trips to the bathroom each night. I never turned on the light in my own house, and on my way back to bed, I heard the unmistakable sound of someone in the dump walking over the cans and bottles. I went back through the house and got my husband's sizable battery-powered lantern, and I quietly opened one of the new windows in the nursery. I was 25 feet higher because the dump was on an incline, and it was 30 yards distance and below me. I saw a dark silhouette standing half-turned from me, holding and unwrapping the frozen meat from the white butcher's paper. And From my angle, the figure appeared to be six feet or more. I turned on the lantern, and the figure threw up his right arm and turned his face away, and then he bent down and gathered more of the paper-wrapped frozen meat, and then it took off down through the woods. I did not see any clothes on this figure, but it was large and dark, and it was massive. I never saw its face, and I did not smell anything, but still this experience changed many things, such as not going out after dark. I never saw anything again. I didn't hear any tree knocks or whoops. I never felt comfortable tilling the garden or doing yard work after that, even during the day. I felt like something was watching me from the woods all the time. I made it a point to feed the animals long before dusk, and I moved shortly after this incident. 
Now I'm 80 years old and this incident has caused a lifetime of interest in everything Bigfoot. You know, I get that. I get that. You see something strange, you see something weird, and it, you, you have to find out what it is because there is no explanation. There would not be, more than likely, there would not be a person down in the ditch where y'all dumped your trash going through. And, you know, that meat was probably, um, I don't know if it was that night, it was probably in pretty good shape. But if it was two or three days, it's probably getting kind of randy, you know? That meat doesn't stay good if it's out in the heat like that. This sounded like it was in the summertime. So this is a, a wonderful story. 80 years old. Isn't that awesome? I love that. I hope I make it to 80 years old. But I love the story, and I appreciate the woman sending it. And if I met you at Gatlinburg, I know I enjoyed meeting you, ma'am. It was a pleasure to meet you. And uh, I was just joking about the total package. I know what you meant. That was kind of ugly of me to say. But, <laughs> but I always say that to my wife. She goes, you know, you look nice in that shirt today. And I always go, I ain't just good looking. I'm smart, too. And she goes, that's right. You're the total package. And then I'll leave. And this is kind of a joke between us. So I'm sorry if I offended you, but I was just playing. But thank you, man, for the story. It was wonderful. All right, here's an email I thought was great. Here's what they write. I had something happen that changed my view of the world back in April of 2011. At the time, I was living in a small house in a residential area of Kokomo, Indiana, which is a bit north of Indianapolis as the crow flies. In my house, it was just me and my black and tan dachshund named Scooter. And Scooter has since crossed over the Valhalla Bridge, but in that time... And all the way up to his passing, he was a faithful and loyal companion to me. He really seemed to like running around in my small enclosed backyard like a nut until he was out of breath. However, he also very much liked riding in cars. And when I would go to McDonald's for food, because he knew he was going to get some tasty french fries as a treat. One of our favorite things we do together would be the occasional camping day on a three and a half acre parcel of land that I owned and still do that lays to the east. For privacy concerns, I won't say exactly where my land is, but I will say that it is out past Greentown, Indiana, and I'll leave it at that. On this particular outing, it was for a single day with my intention to stay from Saturday evening until early or midday Sunday, depending on my mood. So I loaded up my camping stuff and Scooter jumped into the passenger side and took his rightful place next to his daddy. So I drove until reaching the entrance of the gravel road, which went almost the whole way to the back of my property. And on the left, driving in, there was a row of fence posts, while on the right is a line of pine trees that are right up close to one another. And that being the case, a lot of sunlight does not get in through there. I drove back that stretch of gravel road until coming to a small grassy field that I had cleared out in the past. I got out of the car and I let Scooter out to sniff and play, which was his usual routine, although he never went far most of the time, and if Daddy called him back, he would come running. So I put up a heavy-duty tent that I had, and I placed my sleeping bag inside along with my ice cooler and a couple of matching small plastic dishes for Scooter's food and water. And once everything was done, I got out my old and worn acoustic guitar, and then I took a seat in the folding chair. And this was right next to a fire pit that I had made and I'd surrounded with large rocks. I think for the next 45 minutes or so, I played my guitar and I sang some of my favorite rock and roll songs. Now, I can't carry a tune in a bucket, but I do rather enjoy singing anyhow, and the only ones subjected to it at the time were Scooter and any birds or other woodland creatures hanging around. The sun started getting lower overhead, and night was well on its way. I had some seasoned firewood that I had previously chopped up and left it in the trunk of my car until this day. I brought it out and placed my heavy metal cooking grate over the top, and I got the fire going. It wasn't long until I had a decent fire going, and by that time I had pork chops in the skillet and two big cans of baked beans in a heavy cooking pot, and there was enough room on the metal grate where both could cook at the same time. And by this time, the sun was pretty much set, and it was much beyond the fire 
nothing was visible with the human eye. While the pork chops and baked beans were cooking, I went into my tent. I got out a small portable cutting board, which I had brought with me to cut up my potatoes and onions and carrots. At that time, I eyeballed Scooter at the rear of the tent. He was laying on a sleeping bag where my head would be if I were in it. Well, I looked at him, and then I dutifully returned to cutting up my veggies because they would go real good with the pork chops and baked beans. My mother always said to eat your vegetables, and I surely wasn't about to disappoint my mother, whether I was a grown man or not. I got everything cut up on the board, and I figured I should better check up on those pork chops and that they probably needed to be flipped in the skillet. Imagine my surprise when I got out of the tent and I saw that both the skillet and the pork chops and the cooking pot with my baked beans were nowhere in sight. I was thinking, what the fiddlesticks? Is somebody out here pranking me? I looked around the fire as best I could by the firelight. I didn't see a dang thing. Where was my food? I was mad. I remember not only thinking that in my head, but saying it out loud. I finally went back inside the tent. I brought my vegetables out and carefully placed them on the metal grate as best as I could. I think about a third of the carrots and potatoes and onions fell through the slots and into the fire, so that made me even more mad. Once it was done, I sat in my chair near the fire and I grumbled to myself about what could have possibly been a delicious meal. The only other things I had to eat besides Scooter's food, and I wasn't about to eat that. Well, besides his food and a banana and a granola bar, I ate both of them after eating what few veggies I had left. I got out the guitar again and I made up a sad song on the fly about my food and how I was not happy that I didn't have it in my mouth and belly where it belonged. I would say that after another 15 or 20 minutes, I got up and I went to the tent. I tried to get Scooter to go out and do his business, but he wasn't having any of that. No amount of coaxing would get him to do anything. He just laid there on the sleeping bag with his chin on top of it. Well, I said to him and myself, okay, if you don't want to go, so don't go. So I lay down on the sleeping bag and Scooter repositioned himself next to my head. I know I had to have drifted off to sleep because when I'm relaxed, it's usually not long until I am sound asleep. But I was woken up by a metallic banging sound. It was so loud, and when it happened, it probably woke up people in the next county that were asleep at the time. Scooter gave out two half-hearted barks. Then he stopped. Usually the noise like that would have him barking his head off. But no, two barks and that was it. I yelled, hey, who's out there? I really did not know what to think, and I had different ideas in my head, like maybe it was someone playing a prank on me. Or could it somehow be a coyote or a cow that got out of the pasture? I had no good idea of what really was going on out there beyond the walls of my tent. But after regaining some composure, I clicked the little LED blue light on my digital watch. And the time read 1.57 a.m. in the morning. I waited and listened for a bit longer and more complete silence. I think I had fallen back to sleep somehow. And it must have been because even with this weirdness, I didn't feel like I was in any danger. I woke up again later and heard what sounded like heavy sticks or tree limbs being beaten on a nearby tree. And as shortly afterwards, I heard the same sound coming back from farther away. What in the world of Jiminy Crickets is going on out there, I thought. I pushed the button on the side of my watch again, and the LED light did what it was supposed to, and now it said 3.12 a.m. I didn't think I would be able to get back to sleep at this point. I was fuming again, thinking about those pork chops and baked beans I paid for and never got to taste. I was thinking this and a couple other random thoughts when I began hearing heavy footsteps around my tent and do what I thought must have been circling it. Now, this might be speculation, but I think whatever was doing this was purposefully being loud and annoying, maybe to see how I would respond. I don't know, but then I heard something grunting, and that really put me on edge. Scooter was now trying to climb under me and pawing like dachshunds are known to do. 
Now I was thinking, did I need some kind of weapon for protection because I'm not a gun guy nor have I ever been. I did have a small kitchen knife that I used to cut up the vegetables so I kind of fumbled around inside the tent until I felt the plastic handle and then I clutched it to my chest. Now don't any of y'all worry, I could feel around and Scooter was safely off to my side. It was now when I was hearing the footfalls of something I knew was on two legs and that deep guttural grunting had me completely stationary like I was a statue. And then I heard what sounded like a tuba blast. I kid you not. It was quiet for a few more seconds. And then another deep blast that could only be a fart of monumental proportions. It was surreal. And I was, on one hand, completely terrified. And on the other, to my childish sense of humor, it was one of the funniest things I had ever heard. Whatever it was, it kept going around my tent and every so often letting out a huge deep fart that lasted from a few seconds to several depending on whichever fart was coming out at the time. Well, I bet down on my lip and tongue to stifle a laugh because I really, really had wanted to do that. And I finally heard one more huge fart and this one was by far the loudest and probably lasted a good 20 seconds or so. It didn't shake my tent, but I surely smelled what had to be the remains of my baked beans along with the skunky and garbage smell. And then everything went back to complete and utter silence. I heard nothing more the rest of the night. And when the sun came up, I went outside with Scooter. He was more than ready to do his business then, and while he was having his morning routine, I saw my heavy cooking pot. It had a huge dimple in the side, and the metal grate was now completely off the rocks around the fire pit that it had been perched on. Clearly, whatever this was had stolen my food and then thanked me by smashing my pot against my grate. I quickly packed everything up and Scooter and I boogied on out of there. Now, I've returned to my land several times and I never have seen or heard anything like I did that night. Oh, and also, I never did find my cast iron skillet. Oh, this was a great story. This guy doesn't have, he had a full-blown encounter. He doesn't have PTSD. He doesn't have any trouble with it. And he kind of made light of his story and, and added some humor to it. And I love that. And I appreciate the uh, way he wrote it. Such a good story. I'd love to hang around this guy. He's got a great attitude. Hasn't seen anything since. And I guess that's a good thing. Thank you, sir, for the story. At the beginning of this podcast, I told you guys that I got to sit down with Krista of the Blonde and Booze podcast. I asked her, I said, do you have a story that I could mic you up and you could tell a story for our audience? And she goes, oh yeah, yeah, I've got a bunch of them. She goes, you want to hear one? I said, man, let's do it. So her and I walked out to a picnic area outside the conference and uh, we were outside. You're going to hear some outside noises and stuff, but I think that's kind of cool. Anyway, she tells a story of how they encountered what she believes is an actual demon, and it's it's a bit haunting. I'd love to do a bunch of these if anybody lives close to me and they want me to they want to meet somewhere and let me mic you up. You can tell your whole story. You can go an hour if you want to and tell us all about your experiences. I'll record them, put them on the podcast, and we'll go from there. But this will be the last part of the podcast. Thank you all for joining us. And I hope you enjoy Krista's story. My name is Krista Tweedy, and I'm with Blondes and Booze Paranormal Podcast. And we do a um, little bit of everything, but I got into this by doing ghost stuff, paranormal type stuff. We've um, been doing that for 20 years. And uh, I've always been a believer in, in the odd stuff, but... Um, Do you care if I ask questions? As no, you ask them, yeah. So what got you interested? What what piqued your interest in, the, in, in all the supernatural kind of stuff? In the supernatural kind of stuff? Um, I've just seen things, weird stuff my whole life, okay. and I wanted answers. And, and it wasn't until, um, like, my grandmother passed away, and she used to do a lot of weird stuff. She had crystals and things like that, and... I just called them rocks. I was like, you're silly, you know, for having things like that. But uh, so I, I just I just came to love it. And it wasn't until she actually passed away that I found a lot of her stuff, her books, 
she had books on Bigfoot, she had books on ghosts, she had big uh, books on metaphysics, a little bit of everything. So it's a family. Book. It is. Okay. It is. And I always thought she was crazy, you know, and uh, uh, realized that that I think right now, honestly, she's she's passed, and I feel like I live vicariously, like through her. She's you know, sure. she helps to guide me, and I I, I actually know she does because the story I'm going to tell you, she she was a huge part of that after she had passed. So it was, this was back in 2018. Um, I'd always, like I said, always done the ghost thing. We, um, I, I, there's been several cases that we've done and people have reached out and, and they don't get the right help. And, and a lot of them, when somebody says, you know, it's a negative type entity, people are scared. Who's gonna help these people if there's not people out there like myself right. to do that? So I took it upon myself. I, I started studying demonology, and I, I studied under Jeremy Leonard. We'll wait till that goes by. Okay. Edit. <laughs> I might leave that in. <laughs> but uh, I studied demonology under Jeremy Leonard, and he's still to this day someone who I can reach out to if I if I so need you're, to. You're in communication with him. And yes. Okay. Yes. And he, uh, he's the Cajun demonologist, and uh, he, uh, he's, he's helped me out a lot. But this one particular case, I've got a friend who, um, his name is, is uh, Tony Pickman, and he's the one that made uh, the Sally House in Atchison, Kansas, kind of put that one on the books. Um, TV show sightings was, was when he first got his notoriety. So Tony also does the, the, the bad stuff. And um, he kind of recruited me to, to help him out on, he had an upcoming case, and he told me it was a true demonic entity. And, uh, you know, that's another thing I'll back up. A lot of people, you know, say, oh, I have a demon in my house. No, you don't. Demons are out there. However, they're few and far between. So um, just because, you know, you have doors opening or something like that, you know, it could be just Grandma Sue trying to get your attention. You know, it's not always a bad thing. But this one... Dead Grandma Sue. Dead Grandma okay. Sue. Dead Grandma Sue, yeah. He, he asked me to help him with this case, and, and um, I was like, you know, of course, I'm in, you know. So the lady, um, backstory on this location, the lady is one of the survivors of the BTK killer. Oh. The serial killer oh. from Wichita, Kansas. Oh. And, oh. The, and the, the boyfriend, <laughs> he was... He had done 27 years in prison for murder. He was one of the M13 gang members. Wow. We didn't know that until we got there, you know, and then ended up, where goes back, don't judge a book by its cover because I mean, granted, I don't agree with what he did, but he changed his life around and they, they were good people, you know, just scared. And the man was probably, I would say a good 350, 400 pounds and he was thrown in, in the room. And that's where they reached out and were like, okay, there's a little more than Casper here, you know? So, and, and Tony had told me that it's it's definitely, you know, something something negative, you know, he's being thrown the whole nine yards. So we do, we do we go in and we do baseline readings and, and walk through and, and I can usually, I can pick up when um, there's a ghost or... or you feel it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. And so, um, and same thing with demons. When it's a true demon, I get dizzy. I feel like I'm going to pass out. Walk through that whole house and nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. And I told Tony, I, there's nothing here, you know. So um, I have a bad habit. I smoke cigarettes. And my friend Kathy and I went outside to smoke. And so I told Tony, nothing here. You know, I'm not picking up on nothing. So I don't know if they're BSing us or, or just to get us here or what. And, and, and that also happens because Tony is a well-known investigator and, and that's happened with him too. You know, people say they have something just to get them there. So um, they had a shed out back and it was probably 20 feet away from us and was drawn to it. Walked down there to it, my friend Kathy and myself, and something came out and swooshed us. Knocked us both to the ground. True story. So I, I told Kathy, I said, well, I'm going to stay out here and you go in and casually tell Tony, renege on my words, we found it. So Tony, he has abilities himself and he, he didn't have the abilities until he lived in the Sally house. 
and um, his abilities are just phenomenal. I mean, he can name your great great grandma by name. I mean, he's just he's amazing. And so he came outside, and I told him, you know, what happened. Kathy and I did. We're a little shook up, you know. And he kept reminding me, no fear. You show no fear to these things. And uh, we went inside casually, and, and the lady, she, their house, too, was very dark and somber. Uh, but their house was very, you know, they kept the, the shades drawn, and, and um, it was just, just a really dark house, you know. A lot of depression and stuff going on there. And uh, so we went inside, and Tony had the lady sit down, and he, he told her what he was going to do. And when we go in and do this, it's literally, it's full on prayers. You know, before we go, there's preparation. You know, you have to be right with God, number one. You know, we don't go in like if we're sick or, you know, anything like that. We're totally, you know, you have to be, stand your ground, you know. And uh, so Tony told me, he said, I'm going to call it in. He said, I need you to stand here at this hallway and don't let it through. I'm like, okay. And he said, he, he said, I gotcha. He said, just no fear. So he started taunting and finally got it to, to come in the back door, which was led, there was a hallway there. Literally, this thing came in and I could feel the breath. It was this close to my face. I could feel the breath of this thing. Oh, what? Yes. It was literally that close, it's breathing like, in my face. It's almost like a movie, like it's... Like it's this creature right there in your face. This creature was right there in my face. Oh. Yep. Within probably three seconds, Tony said, move. And I moved to the side. He came in. He held that lady's hands. And myself and Kathy, we started praying over them. And, and Tony, he, he just goes into this place. Well, in the meantime, the lady, she's lashing out things, saying things that she shouldn't know, that only something from the other side about all of us. You know, and, and that's the thing with the demonic. They know everything about you. Your deepest, darkest secrets, they can come out. And uh, so you need to trust the people you're with, you know. We, we kept praying. And what I'm going to tell you, unless you witness it, people think I am full of crap. But I swear it on the Holy Bible is 110% true. We started watching slashes, like invisible razor blades, coming onto Tony. His head started bleeding. His arms were being torn up by, <coughs> excuse me, and some unknown force. Our praying got more and more. You know, I started doing Our Father, who art in heaven, you know, and it, it, was, it was more forceful. And after a few minutes, like, you see, you, you, you only hear about it on the TVs where like the house gets lighter and brighter. That happened. I witnessed God come in that house that night. The whole atmosphere changed. Their attitude changed. It was unbelievable in just a few minutes of what happened. But I witnessed it, and God is my witness. It is 110% the truth. And, and to this day, you know, I had, I had talked to them. We don't just like, okay, we're done, we're leaving. We stay in contact, make sure everything's going okay. I told her, I said, you need to open your house. You know, you need to let some sun in and, and, you know, open your windows, get some fresh air in here and, and things like that. And that lady, she went on to um, uh, try out for uh, American Idol. She didn't get it. She didn't get on there. But the fact that she got out of her house and she went and did that, you know, and, and, uh, and he, he now preaches. Whenever I do these, it's like mm -hmm. these questions are just flying <laughs> through my mind. But so this light kind of just shows up and you think it's the Lord. Yeah. And so the demons flee. Is that, it went, what, is left. that what you think it left. happened? I know it happened. So the cutting and stuff, was that just something that was... It was attacking like Tony because... Was yeah. he actually really getting cut? Yes. So he had wounds. He had wounds, okay. scar wounds. And on top of this, he was not even holding a cross, nothing. The palm of his hand, he had a burnt end cross. Does he have scars to this day from that? Well, that happens to him when he does these negative cases. So that's, we knew it was coming, we knew it was gonna happen. But for me, that, that was the first time I actually witnessed it with him 
and this happening. You, you almost did an exorcism in this house. We did. That is phenomenal. Yeah, we did. <laughs> so you can't tell the exact location. What state were you in? Salina, Kansas. Kansas, okay. Yeah, and it was, it was, uh, I, I, I witnessed evil, true evil, and then I witnessed God, the power of God. Yeah, and they are living, you know, like good Christian life. They're good people, you know. At one time, they weren't. Now, there are a lot of people who will say, it's like you, you mentioned when you were talking that it's like grandma can contact you. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people. I've done a little bit, not in depth yeah. reading and listening to podcasts. Yeah. I've done a little reading on it. There are a lot of people who will say that is a demon. These these entities mm -hmm. that a lot you're of people believe that that you're yeah. coming in contact with mm -hmm. that you think oh yeah that's my grandma no it's not your grandma yeah a lot of people believe that so I you don't. don't you don't think that no nope, okay. I don't I don't I believe so ghosts to me they're stuck here they 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 have not crossed over for whatever their reason a spirit is different that is grandma or you know a past loved one or they can come and go they check on us you know they're. You know, when you lose someone, they're they're always with us. You know, you just have to think about them, and that's the spirit side yeah. where they've crossed, but they can come back. And that's what my grandma is. She 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 was there that night. Yeah. So it, it's a uh, crazy stuff. <laughs>